uh, like a good pinball machine, we are bouncing back, Adam, back to Vanessa. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, that just gave me a really good idea, Tom, and that somebody needs to write books like that, start writing books about uh, happiness on this planet. Um, so the, 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 question I, the question I had, sorry, was around um, depression. I've heard you talk about depression, and I've heard you say that uh, depressed people are just people that really don't like themselves very much. And so I, I get that. I think I've heard you say, too, something along the lines of there are certain cases where the avatar, uh, the way the biochemistry is created in their brain, that will cause them to feel um, a depressive state. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering about that. And I'm also wondering about what your thoughts are around antidepressants, if those could potentially help those avatars, or if you're kind sure. of... If you no, yeah, if, if you are, you know, depression, mental state, attitude even, can be changed with change in the constraints, you know, that the avatar places on the consciousness. So if you have brain chemistry that is um, giving you a problem, you know, not normal, the brain chemistry is off, then that can make you depressed. Just because the brain chemistry is wrong, it can make you depressed. You don't have enough neurotransmitters to make all the connections. And without that, you know, the, uh, the mood you get into is a very negative mood. So you can affect mood with chemicals. That's kind of a fact. On the other hand, if you are a person that's not very pleased with themselves and you really don't like yourself so much, you find yourself inadequate, and you find yourself, uh, you know, insecure and all these things. And for that reason, you're feeling depressed because you don't feel very worthy. Uh, then that can change your brain chemistry to where you don't make neurotransmitters anymore, you see. So you can end up with the same problem, which is bad brain chemistry, but it can come from two different sources. It can come just from the rule set, biology, if you will, or it can be something you've created yourself because consciousness leads the body follows. So if you're a consciousness and you are depressed because you don't like yourself, you will modify your brain chemistry to support that. Now, will a uh, antidepressant help? It may help. Okay. It may help relieve symptoms. And if it's an organic, uh, rule set problem, a biology problem, then that's a very reasonable thing to do. It's just like if your biology is such that you don't manufacture insulin, then taking insulin, you know, is a good thing to do because that helps you get by. Your, your, you know, the pill or the shot of insulin makes up for a defective physical system. So a defective, you know, thing in the rule set. It's not really defective. It's just a lot of probability there. You just got something that wasn't working very well. So in that case, it helps. Now, in the case where the fact that you feel unworthy makes you have poor brain chemistry, well, now an antidepressant can actually help that too. But now it's just relieving a symptom. It's not helping you grow up. Well, there's something to be said for relieving symptoms. It makes you a nicer person. It makes it easier for other people to get along with you. Uh, it makes you feel better. So it does that, but it doesn't really help anyone grow up. It's not a thing that, that grows you up. But if it makes your life better, if it makes you to where you can, you know, you can have a good relationship, where you can uh, interact with people without always seeing the negative of everything, without always, you know, being on the, on the unhappy side, well, then, yes, take the antidepressant if that works for you. But once you take it, don't give up on working for the real solution and not just the the, the uh, getting rid of the uh, you know get rid of the, the effect, getting rid of the symptom. So in other words, you take an let's say you feel inadequate, so you you are depressed, so you take an antidepressant. Now you feel less inadequate, you feel better, but don't just say, well, okay, I'm better now. Let's just keep taking this pill the rest of my life. What you should say is, well, this pill's buying me some time. I feel better now. Let me work on that fear. Let me work on that uh, insecurity. Let me work on that not feeling so good about myself. 
and see if I can't get rid of that, find that fear, get rid of it, because then I won't need to keep taking this antidepressant. I can quit taking it because antidepressants come with side effects. You know, they don't just come where it just fixes that problem and doesn't do anything else. They typically come with other side effects that uh, are not something that you'd particularly like to have. They have their, their downside as well as their upside. So, sure, take an antidepressant if it helps you become less depressed. But look for the cause of that depression. You may find it's just biology and you just have to live with that. Well, then just take your pills. Or you may find more likely, much more likely, that it's because of your insecurity, um, you know, not feeling that you're worthy. That's where the depression comes from, not feeling like you're doing it right, not feeling like you really have a grip on your life, feeling lost that ends and, you know, what good am I? Who, you know, am I good for anybody? This kind of thing. And then you get depressed when you have those feelings of failure. Okay, well, if that's the problem, that's fear. That's ego, and you can start working on getting rid of that. And that way, you're working on the problem, not the symptom. So there's nothing wrong with antidepressants. They're helpful, but they're only symptomatic relievers. They're not solutions. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's, it's not for me. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> of course. It's never, ever just for you. You know, It's always you're asking for a friend, right? Friend. <laughs> Tom, what we're going to do next is tackle some of the questions that were left over, or at least I think they were, from Fireside Chat number 31. Now, they're short questions, so hopefully we can get through them pretty quickly. Uh, the first one, could you please state what program, if any, at the Monroe Institute helped you to focus better and improve your connection or out-of-body experiences with the non-physical? Okay, well, when I was at the Monroe Institute, there was no programs. Uh, the things like uh, even the, the um, Gateway and all the rest of those, those were all developed after I wasn't there any longer. So I can't tell you about those specific programs and what they do and how they're different. Uh, you have to talk to somebody that's been there, done that, and um, been through the various programs, and they can tell you their opinion of which one helped them best. But mostly what helps you best happens to be just the one that you happen to be ready for at the moment that you go. That doesn't mean that that's the one that would help anybody else the best. So I don't can't give you any advice there. Uh, you pretty much have to read the literature, see what you think would work, and then just go and try to get as much out of it as you can. But we didn't have those kinds of uh, structured uh, programs. <clears throat> Basically, it was Denny, Dennis, Nancy, Lee, and I with a harness that could let a whole lot of people listen to the binaural beats at the same time, kind of a traveling medicine show, if you will. And it wasn't that structured as the, as the TMI programs are now. I think the best place for people to ask about um, the Monroe Institute programs is, is like you say, people who've been there. And the, the best place for that would be to uh, post your questions or look for the answers on the MBT forum. Without a doubt. Um, next question. Do individuals with more awareness, and they're very kindly put in brackets, i.e. MBT readers and listeners, receive a better role in the next reincarnation because they have grown in this life? Well, if you mean by better role, one that gives them uh, optimal opportunities to grow more, yes, but so does everybody else. Everybody gets, uh, an op you know, gets a next incarnation that's designed to help them grow up. So... Sure, you do that. But, uh, you know, if you're being successful, then you can take on more challenges. If you've not been successful, then you get to repeat much of the stuff you've already done until you are successful. So um, your, your advantage of growing up is that you get to do new things and uh, new challenges. You're moving forward as opposed to just rehashing the same old problems over and over again. So that's the advantage is that you... You continue to grow, but everybody gets another incarnation that is calculated to give them the an optimal opportunity for growing up. All right. Uh, next, who or what are responsible for the crop circles that appear in over in good old jolly old England? Uh, are the lights observed responsible? And if so, what is their purpose? And how does consciousness actually 
benefit or how could consciousness benefit from these? Okay. Um, I've been there. I've looked at the crop circles. I've read most, well, I've read most of the books. I've read some of the books about it. And uh, there have been a fair amount of real science done, research been done. The people have gone over there and examined the, how the crops were bent. And I think some of them found a little uh, sticky substance on the plant that looked like it was created by heat. And you know, so there's been a lot of study of it. It's not that scientists have stayed away from it and ignored it. There's been plenty of scientists who have gone and, and looked at it and stayed out in the fields for week after week, you know, uh, with their cameras running to see if they couldn't catch something happening. And all in all, if you look at a lot of that data, you'll come to a couple of conclusions. One is that a bunch of farmers or students in the middle of the night are not making crop circles. Uh, that's the, you know, that's the standard idea. Oh, it's a bunch of, you know, good old boys after they finish drinking at the bar, they all go out and make a crop circle so they can make fun of the dumb people who believe in it. That's really not the case. You'll find crop circles that are tremendously uh, complex in their shape, in their interaction, the precision that's needed to do that and the tools and the time and it happens overnight, it doesn't make any noise, nobody notices, you know, that a bunch of drunks are out in the field, you know, with, with uh, brooms and shovels knocking down plants uh, is just silly. So that's not really the, the case. Now, that doesn't mean that a bunch of drunks haven't gone out in fields and tried to make crop circles. I imagine they have, but that's really not what it is about. Um, so secondly, what is it about? Where do they come from? And uh, the uh, conclusion that a lot of people jump to is that if, okay, if we agree with the scientists who say that it's not likely that, uh, you know, this is done by uh, uh, college kids playing pranks, then where does it come from? If it doesn't come from here, where? And most of us, because we're tied into this concept of our reality being wholly physical, says, well, it must come from some other people, some other beings that aren't part of here because we've established it doesn't come from here because they, they happen too quickly, too quietly, uh, and are too um, uh, intricate to uh, support a good argument that they come from here. Then it must be space aliens. You know, it must be people from outer space doing it. Well, that's just because they believe that it has to be something physical. And if it's not here, it has to be some physical other planet or place. I think that it makes more sense to say that it's the larger consciousness system. And the larger consciousness system is creating an event that can't be explained. And in creating an event that is difficult to explain physically, they are pushing people to have a bigger picture. If you can't explain this physically, then what is it? You see, that forces people, including and mostly the scientists that come and study it and come to the conclusion that it's not uh, farmers or college pranksters. What is it then? Well, that's an eye opener. Now, if, if most people jump to the idea of aliens as the answer, well, that's, you know, that's to be expected. That's the belief in a physical reality that has to be something physical that it's the larger consciousness system would not be a thing that most people would, would, uh, would jump to as, a, as an answer to where does it come from. So I think it probably does that just to open people's eyes, to show us that uh, reality is stranger than we think. There's a lot of things that happen that we don't understand. Therefore, we don't have all the answers. Be open-minded if you don't have all the answers. You know, uh, Open up to other possibilities. It just as a growing thing helps people see bigger pictures. So I think that's why it happens. And uh, I don't know. Now, that's just me taking a wild guess. I have no idea for sure where crop circles come from. But if I have to come up with an explanation, my explanation would be that it's a wake-up call from the larger consciousness system, just like sticking them with a stick to uh, force us to uh, see that reality is bigger than we think, and there always isn't a physical explanation to things. And what does that mean? So I think that's probably the way it is. We see those kinds of things happening individually all the time with people having some kind of, of uh, what they call paranormal moment 
where they experience something that is just not explainable through physical explanations. And why do those things happen? For the most part, just to help wake that person up and help them see a bigger reality. It's, they're, they're at the point in their development that that wake-up call is important for them. So this is kind of the same thing done on a larger scale with multiple people, not just with an individual. So if the system will do it individually, why wouldn't the system do it, you know, on a, on a larger scale? So that's my thought about crop circles for whatever it's worth. <laughs> I don't know if it's worth much, but for whatever it's worth, that's kind of the way I look at it. I think we touched on the to the topic of crop circles uh, four or five um, five side chats ago. I mean, I know some of these questions you have answered before, but it is nice to just come back and listen to them again. Um, for the next one, for example, do guides exist? Do we have higher or lower guides, and is there a hierarchy? Yeah, I think I've answered this at least a dozen times. But guide a guide Absolutely. is not necessarily a being that floats around waiting for you to ask it a question or to give you guidance. A, a guide is your own personal interface to the larger consciousness system. Okay, that's the guide. So it, when you establish a connection, then that is your personal interface. That interface may have personality, it may have attitude, it may be male or female, it may be configured in all sorts of ways, it may be a historical figure or your Uncle Fred. It could be almost anything, but it'll be something that seems at least serious enough for you to carry on a conversation with it. So you may also see it as a, as a personalization, anthropomorphic personalization of your intuition. That would be another way of looking at it. Your intuition is also a connection to the larger conscious system. So if you uh, want to look at it that way, it's, it's, you can, we could say that too. Uh, yes, everybody who needs a guide has a guide. If it's something you can use, if that interaction uh, with your intuition, your intuitive connection to information, if that's something that's useful to you, then you can have that. If that's not useful to you, then you don't. So it's not like everybody's assigned a guide and that guide just waits around until you, you know, ask it a question. It doesn't work like that. It's just a, an interface to information. Okay, I'm not sure about the next one, though, Tom. Uh, Indian gurus. A recent yogi uh, by the name of Sad Guru suddenly be appeared to become enlightened. It seems that he just downloaded data and started teaching thereafter. So are these individuals picked out before birth? And if so, how? Uh, well, not necessarily. They may be, you know, it may be that they come here and it's kind of as a setup for doing that sort of thing. And they're picked out, not at birth, but before birth. Uh, but it's just as likely that they just grew up to a point where that's something that they were able to do. And uh, they're then uh, put in a situation of communicating with some being that... Uh, gives them information about the nature of reality and how things work or why things are. I mean, we've had that a lot. We have Jane uh, uh, Roberts who channeled Seth and um, we had, um, oh, I don't know, there's been dozens of others. And if you look at most of them, the ones that seem to, to become most popular, the ones that seem to talk and, and have meaning and significance to people, they're very similar. They have a lot of similarities to them. The main difference is the kind of the tone and the language. And that's because they are pitched at different audiences. Like Seth was pitched to a uh, more intellectual audience, a more educated audience. Uh, then there'll be others that are pitched to, uh, you know, to maybe a, a blue collar crowd that uh, is, is more earthy and more direct and straightforward and, and less analytical. Um, so, it just depends on what's needed, who's available, and if that person wants to do that, if it's something that they, uh, they want to do. So it's not really ha have to be a big, a big plan for the system. It's just something that happens when it happens. It can be a plan or it can just generate because the opportunity is there. Okay, next. Aside from being here to learn, is each person programmed to perform a specific service or acts while spending time in this VR? 
No. A lot of people aren't uh, to perform any specific acts. We're here for the most part, most of us, just to interact. And as we interact, we express the quality of our consciousness. And as we make choices, we evolve or de-evolve. But sometimes people come with a plan of doing specific things. And in which case, uh, the system probably nudges them to get that done. Because with free will choice, it's real easy for a plan to go astray. If the plan, particularly if it's a very complex plan, because the being just may make choices that moves it out of range of accomplishing that plan. So in that case, the system tends to nudge to make those plans actually work. But most of us know we just come here and act and interact and don't have any specific thing that we have to do. Now, often we'll come with a specific kind of thing to learn. Because that's maybe a weakness we have. We'll have a, uh, you know, we're working on anger management. We're working on uh, on uh, developing a bigger picture. And that will be kind of primary thing that we want to work on as opposed to just everything in general. So we may come inclined to a particular direction. But mostly after we get here, things just happen and we just deal with it. And uh, we evolve or de-evolve by our choices. Um, so we're going to go back now to Vanessa. So I think probably most of us want to know, but did I come with a plan? (laughs) 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 Well, if you do, you should know by now. (laughs) If you don't know by now, then you probably didn't. You're old enough, you should have some idea what your plan is, but who knows? Sometimes if you do come with a plan, it doesn't even kick in until you're 50 years old. You know, you don't know, but probably not. Like I say, that's more the exception. That's kind of in the margins. Most everybody comes with a, with maybe, a, you know, I should be able to say it differently, maybe a very general plan. We're talking about general plans versus specific plans. Probably not a specific plan. But yes, probably a general plan, because after, you know, when you first start this game of reincarnating and growing up, you don't have any kind of plan at all, general or specific. You just need experience. You get in, you interact, you have experience, you get out, you get in, you have experience. You haven't really built up strengths and weaknesses yet. But after you've been in the system a while, you develop strengths, some things that you really do get and you're growing pretty well and other things that are just harder to get, and you're not doing that so well, then you start having general plans. And the general plan is to work on your weaknesses. So a lot of people who've been around the block a few times come in with general plans, and that's pretty common. And then you get specific plans, which is now you've you've worked the general plans a lot, and you find out they're very specific ways or things that you want to do or you you. You have to work on very specific things, and maybe there's a a connection you want to make with another person, and the two of you work together because you found through several lifetimes that you're just really good at bringing the good stuff out in each other. So now you have specific plans, specific people, maybe specific places, and that is in the margins. That happens a lot more rarely, but it does happen. Okay. When I share your work, I get asked this question a lot about soul contracts, and I say that it's usually in the margins. Most of us come here just for any experience. Um, but now my understanding is but a lot of us do come here with general plans. Yeah, general plans, the things you want to work on. Let's say you, um, you know, general plan. Uh, let's say that you had an incarnation and you were very poor, and because you were poor, your ego – blamed that on the fact that you didn't grow up very much. Well, I just didn't have an opportunity. I just had this, you know, scrape and scrounge all my life and it was a bad environment and I got into crime and I did drugs and I did this stuff because I came in such a poor place. Had I not been so poor, I would have done really, really well because, you know, I'm ready to do well. It's just the environment wasn't good. Well, the next time you'll have a general plan and you'll come in, you know, wealthy. And then you'll find out that now you're blaming, well, I had all that money, you know, it made me really arrogant. Uh, I had all that power, so I started to abuse people, and, and you'll blame that. 
You see, and then eventually the system will take you aside and say, look, <laughs> you blamed it because, you know, you didn't do well because you were poor. Then you blame you didn't do well because you were rich. Now, let's get down to what you, why you didn't do well. You know, you didn't do well because you're not paying attention and you're not trying too hard and da, 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 da. So now they may give you a different kind of an experience. Well, do you want to do poor again or rich or somewhere in between? So now you have a kind of a general plan that what I want to work on is <laughs> not blaming everybody else, you know, for my own problems, for, for having, you know. So now maybe you're put in a situation where it's hard to blame anybody else. I don't know exactly what that would be, but maybe you're in a situation where you're, you know, maybe in charge enough that you get to do what you want, but you're really not very wealthy. Well, it puts you in a situation like that. Now maybe there's few, fewer people to blame, and you still don't do very well. So now you f do something else, you see. And it goes on and on like that, where people try to pick general things that they think will help them. Most of the time, it doesn't really help very much because they'll just, they just are the way they are, and they just interact the way they interact, and they'll, they'll act out who they are in whatever role they get put in. So, there, but there are specifics and, and that some people do way in the margins and there's general things that a lot of people do. And then there's just get in and get out, which is people in the beginning. But mostly the plans aren't all that important because we don't bite by them anyway. And free will gets us off the plan. And it's pretty much that we just express who we are and then whatever happens, happens. And then we go do it again. So it's not, planning isn't really a big thing. Mm, okay. And if we did have a general plan, would that include picking our parents and picking the, the geography? It could. Yeah. If you wanted to say, well, I want a nice middle-class family that gets along well. I was in a dysfunctional, you know, family, you know, and it just made everything hard. So I don't want a dysfunctional family this time. So then the system would try to pick a family where both of the parents were more grown up, had, had uh, lower entropy, and were not so likely to be dysfunctional, and see if that helps. So yes, you could pick a, a different situation like that, because that may be something you'd need to pick. Now, let's say you did that, and you got this functional family a bunch of times in a row, and you had grown up some, and you're doing well. Well, now maybe you want to try another dysfunctional family because you need a little greater challenge. You're starting to, you know, you're not learning that much anymore because you've kind of worked that vein out. Now you need something that's going to challenge you a little more. So now you may go back to some of the things you had trouble with to do them to see if you can't do better this time. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, and my, my original question is yesterday I was actually sharing your model and I was explaining how we're all pieces of the larger consciousness system. We're all IUOCs. And so what the question that was asked to me is, well, where does each IUOC start from with their quality of consciousness? Is if we're all from come from the same source, then don't we all start at the same level? And so and I, I, I thought I just guessed and I was like, well, yeah, we're all pieces of this consciousness system. So we all have the same potential. And then what happens is we all have these different experiences. So that's going to either grow our potential, grow our quality of consciousness or decrease mm -hmm. it. And that brings us to where we are today. So is that accurate? Yeah, that's, for, that's pretty accurate. Yes. And there are all kinds of IUOCs. Uh, there are IUOCs that uh, are perfectly content being raccoons or, you know, dogs and cats and horses and pigs and squirrels. That's okay. They find that avatar satisfying and challenging enough. So there are IUOCs at all different levels of capacity and function. Um, you know that that need a, a a smaller decision space or can stand a bigger decision space. The more you grow up, then the larger the decision space you can handle. You know, if you're a raccoon and your decision space was too large, you'd just be frustrated and and probably dysfunctional. So there are IUCs of all sorts of levels and shapes and sizes and interests, and they interact with however they want to interact with. And there are those that tend to you know, interact as humans. And they're also in all shapes and sizes. If you know, the larger conscious system wants to, needs more seats, 
you know, needs more IUOCs to fill up the uh, players in the in the uh, simulation because in the simulation, that simulation, uh, those avatars, you know, they uh, keep breeding like rabbits, and there's more and more of them all the time. So you need more IUOCs to fill up those spots. Well, then you can just I say copy and paste, but that's because it's a metaphor. It's simple. You can take an average kind of of uh, IUOC, and you can you know, maybe uh, let a, some randomness bring out certain characteristics, more or less, or such a thing. And then you can put those in service, let them grow, fill up those seats. And they will start to diverge, just like you said, because they have free will, they'll have different, you know, different experiences, and they'll start to grow, and they'll start having more and more incarnations, they'll get more and more unique. And that's how it goes. So we all are pretty unique we're not the same at all because our free will makes us makes us unique even in that case of twins with identical environments you know the the twins start with a lot of the same rule set right biology but uh, they're not identical personalities they're not identical people they have their own their own life their own experiences so that was, I think, the first question we had when we started this uh, this chat this time was, if, you know, if you had identical situations, wouldn't it, wouldn't it all be identical and you not have any free will? No, it, free will is what keeps it from being identical. So when we first started, we don't we don't all start with the same quality of consciousness then, because we all start at different levels. If we're all pieces of the LCS. We may have started different levels. You know, some of those, uh, some of those uh, consciousnesses, those IUOCs that, that are playing the raccoons and the foxes and the dogs and the cats, they may one day grow up enough, make enough good decisions, enough quality choices that they may want to be, a, you know, a, a chimpanzee and then maybe a human. So consciousness can grow up that way. It can come up through the ranks that way, but mostly that's not the way it flows. Mostly it's just created as needed to fill seats. Mm. And uh, once created, it, it is, you know, then it's. Uh, mm. And it does the copy and paste function to create. new. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's not really just a copy paste. It's not that simple that you just make things that are identical, but it's similar to that. That's a metaphor. Yeah, you take the stuff of what you've got. And out of that, you'd want to create something that was somewhere in and around the, you know, the average. You wouldn't want to, it's not like there's some low point that you'd want to put it in at or whatever. You just kind of get at the average. The point isn't the absolute entropy that we have or don't have. The point is that we grow, that we're changing, that we're growing up. So it's not so much where we're going to, it's not the, the, uh, destination isn't as important as the as the uh, journey it's the it's the work we put in that's important mm. otherwise yeah. you'd say well why doesn't the system just make all of its i all your iucs perfect right why doesn't it just yeah. start at the top and just duplicate itself well then it wouldn't but then it would have just what it started with. It would have just itself. It'd be like one monolithic thing again, and it wouldn't have, you know, it wouldn't have the, the, uh, you know, the novelty that it needs to create more information. It would all be the same thing. That's not a good solution. It can't just make them all already as low of entry as possible. That's that idea is an idea that that what really matters is the absolute entropy value of the system. That's not it. What matters is that we work at it. We change. We're growing. That's the thing. You see, it's a system. And as long as the system is growing and reducing its entropy, then our evolution is successful. If you put it all up at the top, it's a lot harder to grow. You don't get a whole lot of growth there out of that. There's not a lot of change, not a lot of states to move into. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's more stale. It's more. Um, stuck at that point so what's it going to do then probably start to de-evolve because maybe it just can't support that yet that's not yet natural to the system that was just kind of put there 
So anyway, that's that's a. Uh, I think you got it pretty much right. Is uh, is that we uh, we're, we're we exist to fill a seat because there's a seat that's needed in the in the uh, simulation, and then we probably start out as somewhere typical, and then we can evolve or de-evolve based on that. Now the system may have lots of other ways of creating different kinds of IUECs to start with. You know, there may be just like um, in a, in a procedural programming, like No Man's Sky, they'll have a, a template for a critter of some uh, some sort, and then they'll they'll do a random number which will decide does it have two legs, you know, three legs, four legs, five legs, or six legs. That's a random draw. And then does it have you know is it is it uh, you know 500 pounds, 300 pounds, 200 pounds, or two pounds? You know how big is it? And that's another random draw. You know, does it have spines on its back? You know, well, that's another random draw. So we can make a whole bunch of random draws and make literally hundreds of millions of different kinds of critters just from one template. You see? Well, larger kinds of system may have similar things like that. It may make, you know, it's not that everybody has to be made the same with just a copy and paste of the same thing. It may have ways of creating diversity to begin with. When I say copy and paste, that's that's not so literal as it is a as it is a metaphor. It does copy what it has, what it's done already, and then it does just recreate that like a digital system would. Okay. I think Vanessa was talking about how her mic was muted, so I'll come back in there. And listen, Tom, I was going to finish with a series of questions from Stephen on the optimization of PMR, but it's in 12 parts, and I couldn't work out the best way to approach this one. So what I thought we would do is maybe get you and Donna to sit down and do an interview about that. Likewise, if anyone at home has a topic that they would like to see covered in a new interview, then I think uh, please let us know. We'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, Tom, we've got about 10 minutes, so I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to cherry pick one of the questions from Faith. Uh, Faith, I'm sorry we didn't get around to more of your questions here. I know they are quite old now. The one I'm going to ask you, Tom, is this. Just about all esoteric books state that time is an illusion and not linear. Everything happens simultaneously. You read Seth's books, and the same was said by Jane Roberts. As far as I can tell, you are the only one amongst well-known authors who negates this concept now. It seems to me that time and its illusions are very important in running this virtual reality. So I'm still not clear, even after listening to your experiences, why you think time is linear and not an illusion. Please, could you clarify? <laughs> sure, because that's the only thing that works. Uh, if you have all the future and the past and the present all happening at the same time, well, you are now in a deterministic situation right because you have all the future already exists therefore it's determinism if you have determinism you don't have free will if you don't have free will you don't have consciousness if you don't have consciousness you don't have a system and nothing happens nothing is there is no point so that's why it's illogical if you start with all of that existing all at the same time and there is no place to go nothing to do and you know, nothing happens. Nothing can change. So it's a dead end. It's it's um, you know, as as a uh, as a model goes. It's a model that does nothing. <laughs> you know, it's a model that has no consequences. It's a model that can't change because the future is already all known. So what is what choice? There are no choices. There is no free will. There's nothing. What's the point? There is no point. Nothing happens. There's no function. You see, so that's why it's illogical. It doesn't make sense. Uh, if you are going to have evolution and change, you must have time. Well, people realize that. They realize that time is necessary. They're, otherwise, there's no change. So even though they make a statement that logically says there is no time because the past, the present, and future are all happening, you know, are all there at the same time, then they are stuck with that there is no point, no change. And since that doesn't make a very interesting philosophy because it doesn't go anywhere, then the result or the, the way out of that jam is to say, oh, well, there's, sure there's time, but it's just an illusion. Well, what does that mean? 
What does it mean there's, there's time and it's just an illusion? Explain that one to me. I'd like to see, you know, what it, how we get effective time that is seems to be linear, tick-tock, 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 things change. We make choices, but we don't really. That's just an illusion. We haven't really made any choices. Well, if we didn't make any choices and we're making choices, what's the point? So that's why it doesn't make any sense at all. And I can see why people got there. And it seems like a cool thing to say, but it just doesn't make any sense. So you do need time. The needed time before the larger consciousness system at its very simplest spot, very simplest um, where it started, was just a one zero one zero this that something that could that could uh, make a distinction between two states well that requires time now it's in this state before it was in that state you got a before and you got an after that's time nothing can happen without time nothing can evolve without time so that is a definition of time and then we have regular time, which is different. Now we have a one zero one zero in a, in a regular frequency that creates regular time. Now you can have sequencing. Okay, that's another whole dimension of possibility of of making patterns and connections and information. So it's a lot more information now in sequence. So you can see that time is fundamental. There is no such thing as consciousness if there is no such thing as change. If there's no such thing as time, time is illogically necessary for consciousness to exist. See, space is not. Space is not necessary for anything to exist. Space is purely just a calculation. Time is fundamental. Okay, choice. You have, now you made the choice. Now you've made a different choice. Before the choice, after the choice. So you can't have a choice without time. Without choice, what does consciousness do? It has no function. Consciousness makes choices. So there's a few things that all have to logically be together in order to have a, a real model that goes somewhere and does something. It's not just static death. There was nothing. There never has been anything. There still isn't anything. That's my whole model. Well, <laughs> that's just not a very interesting model. But that's the model you're stuck with. If you don't have time, because without time, nothing changes. No choices can be made. You see, so time has to be fundamental. Here we are. We exist. We're conscious. We, at least we think we're conscious. So then we must have had a, you know, we must be part of this, this consciousness system. I don't understand time's an illusion. Now, I do understand that every reality every virtual reality has its own clock time in our virtual reality is not fundamental time in our virtual reality is a is a choice a virtual reality picks a delta t and a delta x to define its resolution and how much computer resources it's going to need what's the throughput what's the refresh rate that's delta t how often am i going to have to calculate that thing that's delta t and how much, when I do calculate it, how much work do I have? Well, that's going to be the delta X. If you've got a, a lot smaller pixels, you've got a lot more calculations to do. So it's a computer science uh, problem of specifying a delta T and a delta X for a given reality frame. So yes, this universe has its own unique time. And that time was just assigned to it because it was good computer science to give us that delta T and that delta X. Things work here that way. So that's all. So every other virtual reality has its own clock, but they're all based off the master clock, which is the clock that the larger conscious system used to define sequence, to define regular time. But you do have to have time. Without time, there's nothing else. And to just kind of, you know, wave that away, ignore it, and claim that, well, Sure, we have time, but it's an illusion. Is to me, uh, that's like, all right, this is a very complex thing. Uh, how did it happen? Well, God did it. See, that's another one of those things. You know, any question you have, the answer is God did it. How does this work? How does that work? You know, why is gravity like this? What the God did it. 
Well, that's a that's like a an, an answer that doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't provide any explanation. It's just a statement, and uh, no explanation is in the statement. You don't you don't gain anything from that kind of a statement. Well, you don't gain anything just by saying that there's you know, oh, we have some sort of fake time. And uh, that's what we're all working on, but it really doesn't exist. But that's what we all use anyway, even though it doesn't exist. That's illogical. Never been able to get my head around that idea. Now, somebody, I think, Jane heard Seth say something like, you know, that he was talking about these um, databases. We have the probable future, we have the past, and we have we work in the present. And all those exist at the same time. So... There's the future data, and we can look at that, and there's the present data, that's where we are, and then there's the past data, and we can look at that. So we can be in the future, in the past, in the present, all at the same time. It's all here and available to us as, as uh, databases in this reality frame. And I can see that when Jane translated that, she got the future, the past, and the present are all the same, and they're all here all together at the same time. So I think it was just a misunderstanding. And uh, since that time, it's just misunderstanding has been passed around from person to person. And it just sounds so cool to say that, uh, you know, time doesn't exist because that's so mystical and so deep sounding. But to me, it just sounds illogical. And, uh, and on that note, Tom, talking of time, it must be linear because guess what? We have run out of it. Um, no, no, as always, it, it doesn't, it's it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. We can't oh, run out of it. <laughs> we can't run out of it. So no, I won't see you later because it could be any. Okay, yeah, it gets confusing. Um, listen, I wanted, to, I wanted to, to mention something to everyone at home, and this is that uh, if you are or you know a musician who's been inspired by MBT, we would love to hear from you. Um, you know, we've heard some wonderful music produced by Kepa, Lake, Malaya, Nick, Bo. And if you at home have, have, have similarly been inspired by MBT, we'd love to hear your songs. So uh, please email me, Keith, at MBT Events. Um, Tom, I mentioned earlier that you will be going to the Pacific Northwest in the summer, August the 5th, August the 12th. Um, after that, you're off to Sao Paulo in Brazil for a symposium, October 7th to the 9th. People can find out information on that on the future events page of our MBT Events website. Uh, next year, we have six immersive experiences. For those of you who are not on our mailing list, you may not know we are doing six immersive experiences with Tom that we are very excited about. We'll be doing three in March of next year at a chateau in France, and then three here in the USA at a cabin in the Smoky Mountains. That is May, September, and November. We do have a few places left. Now, most of the people who are at today's fireside chat are actually going to be coming along to one of those immersives. So how about you? Uh, email me, Keith at MBT Events, if you are interested in knowing more. Listen, once again, Tom, thank you for today. Justin for editing, Oliver for hosting, everyone else that's joined us, and for you at home for watching. We really appreciate it, and we'll see you again soon.